Hi, I'm Pete Rulon. Today I want to share with you the information you need to know to pass the Part 107 test. I'm breaking the content into small modules based on the various target areas as defined by the FAA. You need to watch the entire video so you do not miss questions. This module has been validated. I have around 450 test questions in my FAA Part 107 database and those questions are known to be in the database that the computer randomly selects for your test. So I have looked at those questions and gone through these lectures to assure that you get the information you need to pass the test. Now, in a previous video, I recommended you purchase this book. This is the Airman Knowledge Testing Supplement for Sport Pilot, Recreational Pilot, Remote Pilot, and Private Pilot. If you have not gotten this yet, go to another module and when you get it, come back to this one. Because you will need to have this both to understand parts of the lecture and to practice some of the content that I'm going to share with you. Do not buy the black and white version because the maps are color coded and you need the color information to be successful. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? First, how to identify what type of airspace that is surrounding where you want to fly your drone. Identifying the height of the airspace and any obstacles both in MSL mean sea level, which is what the airplanes operate on, and AGL, which is above ground level. Drones operate on AGL because we know how high off the ground our drone is, but without having the barometric correction, we cannot go to MSL. We're going to teach you how to locate airports and their obstacles. Okay, what maps do we have? Well, the first map we have is called a sectional chart. Now, a sectional chart covers a region of airspaces. In this slide, you will see that there are various sections of the United States marked out for airspace. Now, you can get maps of each individual section. They're called sectional charts. So each section has a map. Now the map, for those of you who are mature like me, we used to have the old fold-out maps for driving and locating, uh, you know, how to drive from here to here. And these things were like this and like this, and they were big cumbersome things. Well, this is what the sectional charts look like. They contain a ton of information if you know where to look. The biggest part of the sectional chart, as shown, is that it depicts the airports, what type of airports, where they're located. It gives you a ton of information and we're going to learn how to read these maps and how to gather the information from the maps that you need to pass the test. Keep going on this lecture. Don't miss a portion because I would not want you to miss part of the test. There's another. So those are sectional maps. So those are maps of the entire section of the U.S. and all the information. Now they're TAC charts, terminal area charts, and they are more detailed charts. So their scale is 343 nautical miles per inch. Now in the, the world of FAA, you deal with nautical miles, not statute miles, which is what we're used to in our vehicles. Another chart is called the chart supplement. 
and it has extensive information on airports, all their frequencies, and look at page 1-2 through 1-16. If you go to your book, look at pages 1-2 to 1-17, that is a, a chart supplement. So if you look at that, that's a chart supplement. Now, see right down here, it says chart supplement. So if you have a question that asks you to go to a chart supplement, then go to your book and remember that that's in here and it defines what a chart supplement looks like. So let's talk for a little bit about airspace. There are two categories, regulatory and non-regulatory. Within these two categories, there are four types, controlled, uncontrolled, special, use, and other. Controlled airspace is a generic term that controls the different classifications of airspace and defined dimension within which air traffic control surface is operational. In this session, we're going to look at the complex system of aeronautical airspace in the USA. I want to talk just a little bit about the, the various charts that we have available. Um, there are three in particular worth mentioning. The first one and the one most commonly used that you'll use most often is called the sectional chart. And you're looking at, of course, the United States here and how they break down uh, the charting by major cities. There's 37 uh, sectional charts that make up the lower 48 states. And of course, the Hawaiian Islands, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands are uh, available as well. This, these sectionals um, are double-sided and their scale is 1 to 500,000. So they cover some, some good distance and they've got great detail on topography and the different kinds of airspace that will be color-coded. We'll be learning all about that. Uh, obstacles, airports, just about everything that you want to have on a good chart. Then there are what's called the terminal area charts or TAC, T-A-C, and they're in select areas that are the busiest of the busiest areas and they're demonstrated here uh, by these little uh, uh, gray boxes that we see throughout. So in the Atlanta area, for example, you'll have a terminal chart and, and that's going to be twice the scale of a sectional. In other words, 1 to 250,000 scale. So it looks twice as big. And in those complex areas, uh, it's nice to have that better detail. Going the other way is the WAC or the World Aeronautical Chart. That scale is one to one million. So if you're planning a long trip and you want to get kind of the bird's eye perspective of your of your trip and your charting and your planning, a WAC or a World Aeronautical Chart is a great thing to use. This is a example of a sectional chart. There again you can see all of the 37 uh, charts that are available for these regions. We're looking here at the Los Angeles sectional chart. Uh, something important worth pointing out is the, these are updated. Typically uh, every six to seven months in some places like Alaska, I believe it's about five months, so you do need to pay attention to the, uh, the dates and the dates will be listed up here from this date to this date. So we're going to take a look at airspace. Now the FAA breaks up airspace in two kind of major categories or areas. The first one is class airspace, and that gets an alphabetic designation like A, B, C, and so on. And then there's special use airspace. This would be like military practice areas or areas that are restricted. So we're going to look at both today, but first we're going to start with the class airspace system, A through G. Just giving us a little overview, um, this is the airspace uh, a through G, except for F. <laughs> there is no F, not in the United States anyway. And if we start very simply, and I don't want you to get overwhelmed with this because I'm going to move fairly quickly, but this is just an overview. We're going to take each one of these 
air, class airspace systems apart and unpack them for you. But just as a way of introduction, look at the uh, top one here. We can see class A or alpha is a very high airspace. It starts at 18,000 feet. Now that's MSL and that stands for mean sea level. So 18,000 feet above the sea and it extends up as high as flight level 60,000. Once we get above 18,000, we put things in terms of what's called flight levels. And we just drop the two zeros at the end. So this is in hundreds of feet. We'd add two zeros to that and we get 60,000 feet. Coming below 18,000 feet, we get into class E or echo airspace. Think of E as everywhere. Everywhere where there isn't a uh, airport. ATC, air traffic control. You'll see that all over this content. And it's usually associated with a specific airport. So um, Jacksonville Airport has air traffic control associated with that airport. There are some airports, the smaller regional ones, that actually use a regional air traffic control center. But these are the people who are responsible for managing the air traffic to prevent any accidents or that kind of thing. So they control the airspace. A couple terms that you're going to see throughout this course is AGL, height above ground level. Your drone, when you look at the display and it says it has a certain height, that is AGL, it's above the ground level. Now, commercial airlines operate on MSL, height above mean sea level. Airport elevations, altimeter readings, the, um, on the maps, they may give you both AGL and MSL. But if you're looking in an airport elevation, it is in an MSL. And if you see two of them, then MSL is on top, AGL is in the bottom. If you forget that, think there are very few airports that are below sea level. Whatever number is bigger is going to be MSL in almost all cases. So the first airspace is 18,000 feet and above, which commercial airlines use. And you had best not be flying up that high with a 400 foot limit. So we really don't have to deal with this other than understand class A is 18,000 feet and above. Content in these lectures are all designed to inform you, to make you better informed, to pass the test. You might see a question. Class B airspace is generally airspace from the surface to 10,000 feet, mean sea level, because it's airport information, surrounding the nation's busiest airports. I'm going to give you something that helps me. B is blue. If you see a solid blue line surrounding an airport, that is class B airspace. Now in your book, you're going to see on this page, the information you need to identify solid blue is class B and just an FYI, Class C is solid magenta, class D is dashed blue, class E is dashed magenta. Now, flying in class B or Bravo airspace, you have to have approval to fly there. And there is no published time frame to gain approval. Each class B airport is responsible for its own approval. Now, if you go back to the previous lecture, there's the LANC system, L-A-A-N-C, which is kind of an instant approval with restrictions usually to fly 
and that is incorporated in many of our software packages that we can then go say can I please fly here and it'll say yes or no and give you uh, uh, elevation that you cannot exceed so vfmap.com vfmap.com is a search location for sectional charts so if you need to pull up a sectional chart that isn't in this book then you can go to vfmap.com and find a sectional chart now with class b airspace they're not simple they're not just a circle around the airport they tend to be what they call an upside down wedding cake so in close to the airport then from the surface to a certain elevation you can't, you can't fly with permission well as it gets farther away from the airport obviously the airplanes are either flying down or flying up then there's going to be another set of this is controlled airspace from this elevation to this one this elevation to this one so it is a multi-tiered getting bigger and bigger as you go away from the airport location is it a circle no they are often strange and unusual shapes so you have to be very careful when taking this test that you identify which section of the cake you're dealing with so you can answer the questions so how do we know what class an airport is solid blue line so you can go to any sectional chart or any chart that has an airport designation in here and you can see the in this case the solid blue lines are here um, so you can go to your sectional chart this is a portion of a sectional chart that's in your test book now if they're going to ask a question they can only ask questions about these maps you do not have a sectional chart so questions that involve you looking up something on a map that map has to be in the book so as you work through this exercise the better you get practiced on the maps the better you're going to do on the test so understand the only maps they can ask questions on are these and if you want a real test you go find the Dallas Fort Worth Executive Airport okay I want you to pause this YouTube video I want you to go to figure 25 in your pilot's book and I want you to find the Dallas Executive Airport yes there are questions on what airspace and what elevations in the test data bank for Dallas now once you found it you will remember it but I think if you're cold on this map you will have a challenge finding the Dallas Fort Worth Executive Airport I would like you to go look up the sectional chart and find Orlando now when you look at it and I understand that this is a little difficult to see on this sl the slide above but you will see the blue lines you will see the hash magenta lines and those lines define the various tiers of controlled airspace as I said you have the bottom which is surface which is FSC and then 
when they do elevations on these maps you have to mold add two zeros or multiply it by a hundred so the number 10 is a thousand feet the number a hundred is ten thousand feet when you read a number from the map you have to add two zeros to it to get the proper elevation I'm sure they just did this to save space so go in and look at that so what are the majority of the lines in here B is blue so this is blue airspace there's some dashed magenta that we'll talk about later classy airspace consists of surface area with a five nautical mile radius an outer circle within 10 nautical mile radius that extends from 1200 to 4000 feet above the airport elevation so for class C airspace most of the time you're below the 1200 feet so you are in uncontrolled airspace if you need to fly in their airspace which is a violation of the rules then you need to get authorization just an FYI these maps down here have a guide to distances so if you look here and remember nautical miles come and see how far 10 nautical miles is I usually take the pencil that I bring in mark that with my thumb and when it says look for a tower then I look if you forget the size of this circle go look for a class C airspace class Charlie airspace is a solid magenta line designated right here it requires no approval to fly the drone why because it doesn't start to 1200 feet and if you have to then once again there is no scheduled time but that's not something that should concern you as a drone pilot so class Charlie if you remember we've got this birthday cake so you start from SFC and let's say it goes up to 10,000 feet and then from 10,000 to 15,000 it is this wide well when they designate it the second circle may have a T that means it's the top of the inner circle is the start of the next circle out so if you see T that is the top of the inner circle inside the one that you're checking out remember elevation add two zeros to get the real number if you have a minus in an elevation box that means up to but not including so if you have minus 10 well 10 is really a thousand feet if it's minus 10 you can go to 999 but you cannot go to a thousand feet so a minus means up to but not including you will see that on the test so class D it is a dashed blue line and if you want to guess what class E is it's a dashed magenta line blue magenta blue magenta it is without circles now when if you have a question and you can't find the elevation go to your book this is why I say you you've got to one have the book but two you got to be familiar the answer to this question is in your book you will see it is a dashed blue line and it will have a blue box with a number in it that is the top of that controlled airspace and that number if it's 40 as in this example that is 4,000 feet it does not have any shelves yes you need permission 
So if we look at this airspace around Martha's Vineyard, do yourself a favor. Look up where in this book is Martha's Vineyard chart. That will help you. It will help you find these things. But in a test question, they will say, look on a map associated with figure 26. And if they give you a map and they say a number, these red dots are that number. So that's where you start looking for whatever answer to the question they're asking. So they will give you a figure number and if it's if they want to help you find it on the chart they will give you these numbers and you look in that area of the chart to find your answer. Okay class E airspace is everything that is not classified B C D airspace. So a lot of the airspace over the U.S. is designated as Class E airspace. Now, Class E requires approval. It is a dashed magenta line. Most start from 700 or 1,200 feet, and they may or may not have a control tower. So if you see the dashed magenta line, 700 feet, you're under it. You don't have to concern yourself about flying in that area. Obviously, see and avoid and all the good safety practices are still important. So way cross, find it in your book. You see the in the center is that magenta circle. That is the airport. You see the hashed magenta lines around the outside. That is the controlled airspace. Learn to read these maps. Understand they're there. They often have answers to questions. Class Gulf or Class G airspace. That's uncontrolled airspace or Class G is the portion of the airspace that's not been designated as A, B, C, D, or E. And therefore is uncontrolled. So if it's not within the airspace designator of an airport, it is class G and it extends from the surface to the base of the any overlapping class E airspace. Remember we don't have to worry about class E because it starts beyond where you're supposed to be flying. So you can fly freely openly without authorization in class G class Gulf airspace. There is no requirement to um, get approval. And so if you have your drone app, and it may be air map, law, before you fly, open sky, um, these guys keep changing their names, so these names may be outdated. But they are going to have the capability of instant approval. So once again, test supplement, page 13, is your best friend in the test room. It's going to answer a lot of your questions. So if you get confusion, a little kind of boost in assurance that your answer is right, then you can go to page 13 in your book and it's going to give you answers. So uncontrolled airspace, no approval, no designation, no shells, no nothing. If you see airspace with a shaded magenta circle, that is class G, but it starts at 700 feet. Do we need to be concerned as drone pilots? No. So here's a review. I just remember class B is blue. Class B, solid blue. Class C, solid magenta. Class D, dashed blue. Class E, dashed magenta. Now the FAA, and I don't expect you to be able to read this in this video, puts out this chart and it's all over the internet and you can find it, that talks about the various classifications of airspace, some of the sizes. I would print this out, I would look at it, I would make sure you're comfortable with the content. A question you might see, what class airspace does not require approval upon entering? Answer that. 
On a VFR sectional chart, a solid magenta line surrounding an airport means what? Blue, magenta, oh, okay. Okay, the five mile rule. That's do not fly within five miles of an airport. Who does that apply to? So the next categories of airspace are called special use airspace. Special use airspace or special areas of operations, SAO, is a designation for airspace in which certain activities must be confined or where limitations may be imposed on aircraft operations that are not part of the activities. So a couple of them prohibited like it says you can't go there. Restricted that means that there are restrictions. Warning areas there are warning about operating in those areas so you have to be we are as I said next to a military base so we have MOAs in our area which is typically where the they um, do training flights. Alert areas once again that's an area that has some kind of situation going on that you have to be extra careful about. Controlled firing areas. We have a live fire base. When they are setting off their mortars and their machine guns and occasionally their battleships that is on operation in a controlled firing area. Prohibited blue hash mark. What is the clue? Is inside that hash mark you're going to see P and two or three numbers. The P is your clue that is prohibited. You cannot go there. Flights in this airspace are forbidden. Examples might be around the White House, around the nuclear power plant, sub bases are some of the examples. So one from the book is figure 2-2 and you see in there it says P-40. That's actually Camp David. Restricted areas. This is areas where operations are hazardous to non-participating aircraft and contain airspace within which the flight of the drone may be restricted. If you search in the Jacksonville area you're going to find our areas and you are going to see in the sectional map these areas that are restricted. Cannot believe you can fly there unless you know that the operations are cold. There are hot and cold and sometimes around the perimeter of the sectional charts are contact information to see if a area is hot or not and they may even publish the hours that they're hot. Warning areas are similar in nature to restricted areas. However, the US government does not have sole jurisdiction over the airspace. The airspace is designated with a W followed by a two or three digit number. So if you see an area and it has a W in it, followed by a two or three digit number, it is a warning area. The next one, which we have a lot of, is military operations areas, MOA, magenta hash mark. Yes, you can fly in this area. However, the FAA asked the PIC, the boss man, to exercise extreme caution because you often encounter military aircraft flying fast and low. Those are terms you want to remember. Alert area. It's just a warning area. You can fly in it, but it is to alert you that something unusual may be happening and you have to exercise caution. So alert areas are depicted on a chart with an A followed by a number to inform non-participating pilots of areas that may contain a high volume of pilot training or 
unusual type of aerial activity. Pilots should exercise caution in alert areas. So if you look on figure 2-6 of the book, you're going to see an alert area and how it's designated and it tells you what is the kind of extraordinary risk that you may be facing. The next airspace we want to deal with is CFA, Controlled Firing Areas, and those are areas that could be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. So just take a moment to study this chart. It is available on the internet, but it talks about, you know, is it regulated? You know, what are the purposes? So this is just kind of a good way to review the content that we have been presenting. Now, a typical question. And so we've got Savannah Airport, and it's in the book, so get used to finding it. What is the distance across Savannah Airport airspace? Well, you can see the outside circle. You have the chart ruler here. And so all you have to do is measure that width, go up to nautical miles, and you can see that this happens to be 20 nautical miles across. Test favorites. So these are the things that pay extra attention to. How wide is Class C? Typically 20 nautical miles. Class D extends up to 2,500 feet. Where is that answer? That chart on page 7, I believe. The next question, Class D extends to 2,500 feet AGL. Where is that answer? It's here. MOAs, what is a hazard? Military training activities that necessitate air acrobatic or abrupt flight maneuvers. Those are the words on the test. Low and fast is another set of words you can see on the test. Restricted usually and often invisible hazards to aircraft, i.e. military, firing, gunnery, guided missiles, anything else, it can be found in that. So once again, this is a chart that is available on the internet. I would ask you to download it. It's going to kind of give you a sense that Class B is multi-tiered. Class C can be multi-tiered. Class D, it gives you some elevations. This is just you're ready if you can answer the information that's on this chart. You're going to be very well prepared for those type of questions on this exam. So when you're flying at least a commercial aircraft, you have two types of designations. You can be instrument rated. And so you are going to be typically flying on an IR flight route. You're typically, and so if you're instrument rated, you're going to be flying higher and typically on a IR route, which is an instrument rated route. If you are just a private pilot flying in a little Cessna and you're not instrument rated, you're visual rated, which means you are reading the map to figure out where you are and then those are following typically visual flight routes. Now, each of those routes is designated with a number. So it might be IR-423, IR-1731, VR-109. So on the map, next to the lines of these routes, you will see the designation. So if you look on your map and you see a gray or black line with IR or VR, those are military routes. 
the blue ones are Victor Airways for civilian routes. So you have flight routes. So military training routes are used by the military aircraft to maintain proficiency in tactical flying. These routes are usually below 10,000 feet MSL. There are a few higher. They are operations in excess of 250 knots. Those things I would remember. Routes designated by IFR are instrumental routes. VFR are visual routes. Visual routes are normally going to be lower than instrumental routes. So, typically routes above 1,500 feet AGL are flown on instrument flight rules. Routes under 1,500 feet uh, AGL are flown under visual flight rules. So MTR, military training routes with four numbers, designate flights flown at 1,500 feet AGL and below. Military training routes, which are the gray, with four numbers designate routes flown at 1,500 feet or below. At such a low altitude, this does present challenges to unmanned aircraft. Military flight routes with three numbers denote routes flown at least a segment above 1,500 feet AGL. So if we look at the figure above, <coughs> so we look at the figure above, you're going to see some gray routes and you're going to see some blue routes. Gray military, blue civilian. You're going to see VFR or you're going to see IR and then you're going to see numbers and remember the code on how high the military are flying in their routes is based on how many figures in the route number. So there's a question. What airspace is Hayward Executive Airport in? And this is figure 74, area 6. And this would be a typical. So you see class C. How do we know it's class C? Magenta. So you see class C surrounding the airport, which is designated by the black. So in the sectional airspace, you see the bottom is 1,500 feet. You need to pull out the chart on this, but it's up to and, but not including, because it's a minus 15. Below that airspace is marked with a dashed blue line, which is control B airspace, which is designated by the blue arrow on the map. So MSL versus AGL. If the information is designated to be used primarily by pilots, they use MSL. They need a barometric com correction to correct their altimeters. And we do not have the capability on our drones to do MSL. If the information is designated for drone use then it is reported in AGL. So we operate in AGL, pilots operate in MSL. So be careful that you read the right height when answering questions. So here's a, another summary of the various airspaces, the information about it. So here is a review video. Here's what a sectional chart looks like. And this is 
such a small piece of this. The sectional chart is actually a really big, massive, and scary piece of paper. We have one for this area, and it's absolutely huge. And as you look at it, it is so cluttered with information that it's almost impossible to discern what the hell is going on. And that is the key challenge in this part of the test is just discerning their just really old and terrible, terribly formatted sectional charts. I suggest you get the chart for your region. You can download older charts at sdp.io slash chart. Um, all like real pilots are required by law to carry one of these things around. And we do have a physical one. It's cool to have. Um, you can just pretty much go on and buy one on Amazon or something or stop by a, an airport in your area. They'll, they'll probably be able to sell you one. Um, first of all, these sectional charts have a legend. And when you're taking the test, they will give you the legend. The legend tells you just about everything you need to know to get all those sectional chart questions correct. This is great news because understanding these charts is a freaking nightmare and requires you to memorize lots of stuff, except you don't have to memorize it because of the legend. So let's look at the first part of the legend here. As we look at this, you can see they're, they're telling you lots of things. They're showing you some diagrams of the airports here. Um, they're telling you what, like circle on an H, it's a heliport. And they're also telling you what, this is something you'll actually, you're more likely to see on the test is the airport data. So over each airport, there's gonna be a little diagram that has some of this information, not necessarily all this information. They don't put it there for everything, including uh, like the code for the airport and the frequency for the airport. The look, if you're wondering what Unicom is, they might ask you what the Unicom frequency for an airport is. The legend will tell you Unicom and then point to an arrow that shows you the right number. So you might be feeling overwhelmed when somebody, when the test asks you to find the Unicom for an airport, take a deep breath, look at the legend and then just match it up. So you don't necessarily have to remember which of that mess of numbers is the Unicom. Um, all of those different numbers are explained in the legend. So you don't have to memorize that. Here's another part of the legend. For example, this legend tells us that the blue lines here indicate class B airspace. The magenta lines indicate, indicate class C airspace and then the dotted blue lines, class D airspace. They tell you what the number in the box means. That's the the ceiling of the class D airspace. You can see class E airspace for really small airports is in like this dashed magenta here. All those crazy lines, if you're wondering what they mean, come back to the legend. If you forget the difference between blue and magenta, as any person would, come back to the legend and you can see. There's a whole section here on the different towers and exactly what that means. You can see that um, they even tell you that this first number here actually means above sea level, while the second number in parentheses means above ground level. So even if you forget everything I taught you about charts and you get there, take some time and look at the legend and just refresh your memory. Um, let's take a look at what airspace looks like on a chart, how these, what they call sectional charts. They, I would call them maps, they call them sectional charts. Airspace indicates. Okay, so this is kind of my local area here, and the the Groton Airport is here. And if you're wondering about the airspace, look, there's a, a dashed blue line right through here. And maybe you've already forgotten whether a dashed blue line is B, C, or D. Again, go up to your legend here, and here you'll see a dashed blue line is class D airspace. See, I, you don't have to know anything about the chart. You can already figure this stuff out once you know how to piece it together. What frequency do you need? If you want to contact the Groton airport and you're in an airplane, and you have a radio and you're not flying a drone because it wouldn't be legal, but they'll want you to know how to do this. Well, it's, it's going to be the 125.6. But if you were confused about that, again, you could just look at it. What does the number 25 in the box mean there? See number 25 in a box? If you're not sure what that means, go back, look at the legend again, and you'll see, like they have an example here, number in a box. That's the ceiling of the Class D airspace in hundreds of feet. 
So the number 25 in a box, that means the ceiling of the Class D airspace is 2,500 feet. The top of it. Meaning if you were a private pilot in like a manned airplane, you could be cruising along at 2,600 feet and not have to call in for permission to enter. That's, that's what that number means. I know these charts are overwhelming, but I promise if you take it and you look at tiny, small pieces of the chart and you refer to the legend, you can make sense out of it. Even full-blown pilots with many years of experience are uh, frustrated and confused by the maps. So if it feels overwhelming, I get it. This is the Boston area, Logan Airport. And what you'll see here are concentric blue circles. Remember when I showed you that chart of the upside down wedding cake? That's what these are indicating, the different altitudes of the Class B airspace around Logan. You'll see some numbers here, 70 over 30. This is the upper and lower limit of the Class B airspace. It's not 70 feet and 30 feet, no. The FAA has decided to drop two zeros from the numbers. So 70 means 7,000, 30 means 3,000. They, they often do this. And so they will never drop three zeros or one zero. They will always drop two zeros if they're dropping zeros. It is a weird standard that you don't really see in other places on the planet. Like they could drop three zeros and put a K there and call it like 7K over 3K. And that would make sense to most humans. But the FAA has their own kind of way of doing this. And it's worked out great for a long, long time. If you look closely at this, you can actually see a little diagram of what the runways look like at Boston Airport. And you can see that, oh, there are some little mountains here. If you were to look really closely, you could see the exact elevation of these different peaks. All the information is there. <laughs> the hard part is weeding out the information you need from the stuff you don't necessarily need. Here's a super close up of those numbers. And this is how you need to think about the charts. You need to look really close. When you get this close, it can start to make sense and not be overwhelming. Here's a question from their practice test, but it's just like you'll see on the real test. What is the floor of the Savannah Class C airspace at the shelf area, the outer circle? And then they're going to give you three numbers, 1300 feet. Um, and in this particular question, you'll probably see, um, maybe it'll be 25 over 13. 25 would be the ceiling of the Class C airspace and 13 would be the um, floor of the Class C airspace. Because remember, it's it's like a tier. It's floating out there. These uh, numbers are always above sea level, which is MSL, not AGL, which is above ground level. If you have a hard time remembering if it's sea level or ground level, well, the legend tells you that, so you can refer back to that. You can also think back to the history of the FAA because the FAA was founded before like proper computers and electronics and GPS and stuff. So somebody in an airplane, um, they could have an altimeter, which would use barometric pressure to kind of determine what their altitude was based on the air pressure. But of course that's, that altimeter would only know above sea level. It wouldn't be able to tell if you were flying over a mountain or something. So modern GPS could figure out above ground level, but these older airplanes could only determine sea level. So of course they're going to write on the charts the altitude above sea level. Um, so right away you can eliminate AGL and then you just have to look, does it say 13 for 1300 or 17 for 1700? Let's look at another close up. This is an extreme close up of a red flag. <laughs> that red flag is important on the map that indicates a VFR checkpoint. VFR stands for visual flight rules. This is just, it's just a, like a little beacon that pilots could use during navigation. Again, kind of heralds back to days before complicated GPS and stuff. What they want you to know about these red flags is planes might use them as beacons and therefore there might be more planes in this area. The planes probably aren't going to be flying below 400 feet, but they want you to know this because they're really concerned about drones flying into airplanes. Here's another super, super close up of a tiny, tiny section of a map. I just wanted to show, um, in this particular example, you can see 41 over SFC. 
This means the ceiling of the airspace is 4,100 feet. You want to add two zeros and then F SFC stands for surface. You can see a little map of the airport there. Look, that little dot, it's got a tower. So you can see exactly which direction the runways are pointing in. And there's lots of information about uh, like the nearby peaks, that kind of thing. Let's take a look at another close up here. Um, here, well, we do have a tower here and you can see it even says the name of it. Um, here's something else and it's, this is the altitude and this is above sea level. And then 233 is the altitude above ground level. So they're telling you both the altitude of that tower above sea level and above ground level. So you could use either. You could also subtract those two numbers and figure out what the altitude of the ground level was at that particular point. That would be 513 minus 233. So uh, what is that? Like 280 would be the altitude. Um, those don't have the two zeros there. That tower is not at, you know, 51,000 feet. <laughs> um, here's another interesting marking. See the little parachute dude there? That means that there might be skydiving in there. It might just be recreational skydiving out of this particular airport. That's the kind of thing that's actually kind of practical. You should know if there might be skydivers in the area because skydivers will pass through that space from zero to 400 feet and you don't want to crash into them. That's one of the reasons you really need to be keeping your eye out. Don't fly your drone into skydivers. Uh, more icons here. Here, this particular airport has skydiving and it also has gliders. And they just draw a picture of a glider. You can also see, look, there's the visual flight rules little beacon there, as well as all this information about this, you know, pretty small airport. So here's a question about these charts. With ATC authorization in this imaginary world where you could actually get authorization, you're operating your drone approximately four statute miles SM southeast of this airport. Which hazard is indicated in that area? high density military operations in the vicinity, um, an unmarked balloon on a cable, either above ground level or above sea level. Again, it's, it's probably going to be above sea level. Um, and in this, I'm not showing you the right chart, but you'll see a picture of a balloon when you look at this particular one. Just know that when you actually find the location on the chart, there's gonna be a picture of a parachuting guy or a balloon, and sometimes there'll be a note that just says the balloon. I'll give you links to these practice tests so you can actually take them. I don't want to give away the answers to the actual practice test so much because I want you to actually work through it. So at another airport, which frequency should be used for CTF, CTAF communications? If you're like, how do I know which of those numbers is CTAF? Come back to your legend. See here, see the legend says follows the common traffic advisory frequency CTAF and indicates this little C. So you can just look at the airport data and see the C. That means that it's this number here. And the star here indicates that it operates only part time. It's all in the legend. You might have been tempted to look at this number. That's the ATIS, the Automatic Terminal Information Service, which might have information on, on rental cars or whatever. So when in doubt, go back to that legend and just make sure that you're looking at the right number. Uh, let's move on. Okay, you'll see these like kind of blue paths here, those are just indicating frequent flight paths. And all the FAA will want you to know about these is that there might be more airplanes in there. They're not going to be flying under 400 feet in all likelihood, but they want you to know to just use extra caution. Let's talk about prohibited areas. These maps will have lots and lots of prohibited areas and military operations areas, lots of places either you shouldn't fly at all, or you should use caution around. And the prohibited areas, you just shouldn't fly. And um, this is the one from the FAA samples, but it's actually indicating Camp David where presidents like to vacation and stuff. So they don't want any air traffic over this place. Uh, restricted areas are not as restrictive as prohibited areas. They have different types of rules and stuff. And here's a sample restricted area. Again, the, the legend will tell you that these like blue lines with the lines here uh, indicate a restricted area, but they also tend to just write it out. There's numbers here that start with the R and then have a code. If you look at your sectional charts, 
over in the like the bottom or the margin of the sectional chart, there'll be uh, some notes about when exactly it's restricted. Usually there's some sort of hours. And I think the test will even ask you uh, like to look up a phone number there. I don't actually see any phone numbers in my sectional charts, but they will have frequencies where you can listen to get some information about whether it might be in use or not. Um, specifically, the FAA wants you to know this language about restricted areas. Restricted areas denote the existence of unusual, often invisible, hazards to aircraft, such as artillery firing, aerial gunnery, or guided missiles. Restricted areas. <laughs> Just want you to associate in your mind that language. Let's talk about the MOA is the military operation areas. Here's an example of the military operation area on a map. These are places where, you know, people might, uh, the military, Air Force, Navy, anybody with planes might be flying exercises, uh, used to live in an MOA. It's not like they're deserted areas. They can have, you know, towns and neighborhoods and stuff. And when the military would be doing exercises, I'd get like weird, like huge dual rotor helicopters or like a, a convoy of massive cargo planes coming in at like 600 feet and just like causing my whole house to shake. Uh, these MOAs are kind of like, all over the place and it doesn't mean you can't fly in an moa but the faa wants you to um exercise extreme caution of course because it really can be dangerous and they really do fly very low often uh, and to to just check the information in your uh, chart or your your sectional we'll talk about those docs in a little bit military training routes which might be indicated with the letters mtr ir or vfr here's an example of what they look like on a map um, this is the FAA sample. You can see this particular one shows IR037. Um, and that's just an example. You might also see it indicated as VR, not VFR, but VR. Here's a sample question related to it. The chart shows a gray line with VR1667, VR1617, etc. Could this area present a hazard to the operations of a small UA, unmanned aircraft? Um, the... In general, they're not going to present you a question and the answer would be like, no, no, you're fine. Just do whatever. They're always going to present hazardous situations. So right away, we could pretty much eliminate no as an answer, even if we had no idea what it was talking about. Um, in this particular case, the answer is B. Yes, these VR lines indicate military training routes that go from the surface to 1,500 feet above ground level. It's, we know it's 1,500 feet because it's a four-digit code. You probably won't need to know that in the test. Either way, it goes down to ground level, and that indicates that planes really might be flying under 400 feet, so it really could be an issue for you. 